Hi! Most games need them somewhere. Resource bars. Mana, health, doesn't matter. This kind of visualization is easily understood and recreated. Let's learn how. We started having a look at the basics. And after that, we will expand on the concept by adding some sliding animation, displaying a value in direct numbers or percentages, changing colors based on resource availability, calling an event once the bar is filled up completely, and lastly, how we can turn the horizontal or vertical bars into circular ones or even arcs instead. Plus a little bit about implementing a good component layout in the inspector while doing so. That will make working with the system for future you that much more convenient. And wrapping up, we will have a look at how Odin Inspector can improve our component layout even further. You can find the script on my GitHub in case you get lost. Let's start with the background of our resource bar, as it gives some much needed contrast to evaluate how full or empty our resource or start to track is. Make it as big or small as you need. I'll be naming mine resource bar, since I'll be prefabbing it at the end to make it reusable. And that's a good name to remind me about what it represents. Create a new UI image as a child element, which will be our tracking bar in this case. Click here and press Alt in the Rec Transform component. Alt will toggle an option to have the image fill the whole area of your background image. Click here and it will expand. As you might have seen, the naming of the values changed by doing so. Instead of position X and Y, width and height, we get top, bottom, left and right. By entering some values, we can give the bar a little bit of margin to the edge, leaving the background visible and creating a simple border for our bar. The useful thing about this is that the values will stay that way, no matter how big or small you need your resource bar to be. To turn our image into a bar that fills or empties as needed, click on this image type dropdown, which shows up once you set up the graphic. Mine is just the standard rectangle that comes with Unity. Change it to filled. It usually defaults to radial 360 with a start at the bottom. You can check how filling and emptying would look like by changing the value of the fill amount and toggling the clockwise value. This fill amount only goes from 0 to 1, but it won't stop us from using any other values. Think of those values as percentages. We need some code now to make it work. First, the obvious. We need a reference to the image we want to use as our visualization, as well as a maximum value and the currently available resource amount. I'll use 100 for both initially. Add a bool for us to toggle to enable or disable overkill mode. Also, let's add an attribute above those values. The header attribute adds a useful headline above them in the inspector. Create a new method called update bar and resource text. And yes, that's foreshadowing. Set the fill amount to our currently available resource. We do it like this. We set the bar's fill amount to the currently available resource divided by the maximum amount of our resource. This should give us a value between 0 and 1 as our fill amount demands, with just one thing to keep in mind. We need to add a bracketed float in front, or else our decimal values would get discarded. To make sure we won't run into any divide by 0 scenarios, check for that and set the fill amount to 0 manually. Call the method and start. Next, we need a method to change the amount we have available. It needs an int parameter and it needs to be public so we can call it from other scripts. We will also make this return a bool to notify the calling script in case the change could actually be made. Let's think about a health bar. We might want the current health to be able to go below zero if we attack with a mighty hit, basically doing an overkill. That would be alright. But if this bar would represent mana and our player would try to cast a spell costing more than her current pool, that wouldn't be allowed. By returning a bool, we can have the calling script act on if the action could be performed or not. We add the change to our current mana first and then make sure we are not going below zero or above our maximum amount of mana. We'll be using math clamp, tell it the value to check for, the minimum and maximum value allowed and set it to our current mana value. Then we can just set the fill amount like we did in start and return true, since the call was successful this time. 
Let's give it a first try before expanding. I have a fireball skill that takes 10 mana and a mana potion that recharges 25. The testing script to achieve it looks like this. A simple value for the amount of mana it uses and a method that gets called when the skill or item is being used by the press of a button. In case it was successful, we print it to our console. In case it wasn't, we changed the message. I hook it up to my UI like this and this is the end result. The bar fills and empties as needed. But that looks kinda bland, doesn't it? I'd rather have it fill or empty to the new value instead of just jumping straight to it. Back to the code. We need two new values at the top. First, the time we want to allow for the change to happen. I'm usually defaulting to a quarter of a second for a nice visible change. Depending on the speed you need, 0.125 seconds are good as well. Below that feels a bit too quick to be noticeable. Since I rarely go above half a second, we can add a range attribute to the value, that way we get a nice slider in the inspector to pick our timing. Second, we need a coroutine to smoothly fill and empty the bar. Let's declare one like this. This coroutine is going to be an IE numerator we call smoothly transition to a new value with the float parameter. Why don't we use update for this? Update would run constantly, while our coroutine will only be called every time there is a change in our resource. To me, this works better than constantly checking an update if the bar is supposed to be doing anything at all. We grab the current fill amount, and because the animation is time-based, we will set a float elapsed time to zero. Next comes the short while loop in which we check if our currently elapsed time exceeds our animation time. If it has not done so already, we'll add the current time dot delta time to the elapsed time and calculate the filling of the bar like this. This time we are going to use a lerp method to change from our original fill to our target fill. Yield return null leads to this loop waiting for the next frame to continue its checks and calculations. Lastly, we set the fill amount to the target fill value. To call the coroutine, create a new method called trigger fill animation. In it, we set the target fill, check if we already add the desired fill amount, in which case we don't have to do anything else, check if the coroutine is already running, in which case we stop it, and then start the coroutine and assign it to our coroutine value. We need to assign it because we can't stop the routine otherwise which would probably lead to undesired behaviors of animations overwriting each other and getting confused. Whenever I add or refractor the code we have written up to now, I will mark it with this kind of blue box. I hope that helps in keeping track of the changes for you. Let's give it a check. Alright, works as intended, but now we are going to add some text to display the current value of our resource or a percentage. Create a new text mesh pro child element of your bar and again hold down alt and expand it to the needed size. Style it however you want. I'll be using a text style I predefined for this use case or on text styles here. If you never worked with text mesh pro before, get this tutorial a watch. Add using tm pro at the top of the script. Reference the new tmp text and add a small public enum called display type. It offers four options, long, short, percentage and none. In case you need a reminder on what those might look like, you can change how enum values are being displayed in the inspector by using the inspector name attribute. I used a straight line as a separator because a slash in this name seems to lead to a line break. Create a value for it so we can set it in the inspector. I'll have a default to percentage. Create a new method called setCurrentResourceValueText. Depending on what we set our display type to, we want to switch our output. In case of a long value, we will set the text of our text field to this. Our short value will just hand us the current number and when it's set to percent, we are going to display the value in percent, obviously. Remember our fill amount only going from 0 to 1? By multiplying it by 100 and rounding it to an integer, we get a nice clear number. By none, it sets the string of our text box to empty. Yeah, this might feel like overkill. After all, you only might need one resource bar. Why the different layouts? I like to create my systems in a reusable way. 
This helps me to reuse this resource bar across different projects with different needs to display different kind of values. It gives me the desired options and will keep me from having to rewrite this code for different use cases down the line. There can be made a case for if we set the enum to none, the text field should generally be deleted, so it won't take any space and resources from our game, but I'm not optimizing to that extent at this point in time. Call the method at the end of our trigger fill animation method. Next, let's change the color of our bar depending on its value. To get control of the color change, Let's use a gradient and add a check if you actually want to use a gradient as well. The far left side of the gradient should represent the color an empty bar gets assigned. The right side corresponds to a full bar. Create a new method called useGradient. Its contents are simple. In the case we don't want to use a gradient, return and do nothing. Otherwise, set the bar's color to the value of the gradient corresponding to the bar's fill amount. Call it inside smoothly transition to new value here, and you are already done. If you're using one of the blend modes, it will smoothly transition. But by using fixed, you can set the values at which you want to suddenly switch colors, which is a cool effect, I think. Just enter new percentage values for where the colors should change from one to the next. Next up is a little bit of eye candy. Let's have something happen when the bar is completely filled up. I have some sparkles showing up for this. Since I'm using this system across projects and will absolutely forget about any custom events I set up in code, I'll use a Unity event for this. That way, I can set up what I want to happen directly in the inspector and keep the visual reminder. Declare a new Unity event at the top and an accompanying previous fill amount float alongside it. Create a handle event method in which we check if the previous fill amount was already set to full. In that case, return. Otherwise, check if our bar is filled up completely, and if it is, it should invoke the event. Call this at the end of our smoothly transition to a new value coroutine, and below it, set the previous fill amount to the bar's current one. This will prohibit calling the event multiple times in case like drinking 4 health potions while our HP are already full. All right, the core functionalities are in now. Let's add three more methods to make working with these bars from outside our script easier. First, let's handle buffs and debuffs to our maximum resource amount. Add a new absolute maximum value at the top to limit how big this resource pool can actually become. Create a change maximum amount to method with another int parameter. We are going to need two clamps this time. First, for making sure our desired value does not exceed the absolute maximum we set above. The second one clamps our currently available amount between zero and the new maximum. That way, in case we had more resources than possible for the new maximum, it will get reduced appropriately. Lastly, call the trigger fill animation to have the transition be visible. The second method is one in which we configure the bar shape and properties. Add a shape type enum at the top so we can set up what kind of direction we want the bar to use. Inside the method, set the fill method based on our enum value. In case we don't want to use a gradient, we set the color to white and lastly we call the update to our bar. The cool thing about this method is if we call it in on validate, whenever we change the enum or gradient check, it gets updated inside the image component of our bar without us having to change anything in there ourselves. This saves a couple clicks every time. Our third method is a setup method. We might have to set up these resource bars in other scripts after all. Just put all the needed parameters in and assign them to this script's counterparts. Call our configuration method and trigger fill animation at the end to initialize it. And a tiny bonus, since we are constantly selecting the bar or text field instead of the parent object of our resource tracker, finish with a selection base attribute on our script. 
This way, and in case you put it on your root element for this tracker, you will always select the game object this script is setting on. Prefab your resource bar at this point. Well, that's it for horizontal and vertical bars, but maybe you want a circular one. We can keep all of our work up to this point, just change your image to something with a round shape. If you only want the outline of a circle, your image should look like that. If you want only a part of the circle to be used, we need to get math involved. And we need to change a few lines in our script, since we basically have to remap which value will now correspond to full. To keep things easier for ourselves, we'll keep zero as our starting point and just rotate the circle so we get it where we want it. Let's start with the simple things first. Add circle and arc to our base shape types. Make a new header for the arc settings and a value for our end value. It ranges between 0 and 360. In our configuration, we add circle and arc like this. They are identical at this point, so we don't have to write the assignment twice. In case I use circular bars, they always start at the top, so I hardcode that in too. Next comes the method to calculate the circular fill amount. This is a calculation I use for it. The first time we are calling this is up here in update bar and resource text. And the second time is in our trigger fill animation. We check if we are using an arc and set the target fill accordingly. Lastly, we also need a slight tweak in our use gradient, or else we won't get the full gradient to work with. Alright, if you do not have Odin Inspector or don't want to use it, this is the end of the tutorial for you. I hope you enjoyed it and managed to follow along. If you liked it, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more like this. Ha, cool, you're still here. Awesome. <clears throat> Onwards to the Odin part. It is completely optional, as Odin is a paid asset, but it can optimize our inspector for this component a little bit more. Let's see how. Add using Cyrenix.OdinInspector at the top of your script. We only want to see the options for our end degree value in case we set our bar to being an arc shape. We can achieve this by adding a show if attribute next to the header. The condition is our value called shape of bar, and we only want this to show if that value is set to arc. Our gradient can be hidden without issues if our use gradient is false. Since that's a simple bool, we can just hand it over like this. Since we urgently need the bar graphics as well as the text field, add required to them. That way, if they are missing, we get an error directly on the component. Save me multiple times already. Having a range of our animation time is a good first step, but maybe we always want to have a few presets we want to pick from. I usually have four sets I toggle between based on the need for animation speed. This way, my project's UI stays more consistent. By creating a new enum for the most used speed settings I need, and saving the corresponding value to the previously visible animation time, I can make sure my animations are not all over the place. The enum toggle button turns our dropdown into handy buttons to click. And lastly, to make testing much easier for us, add a bool test mode at the top. We can create small buttons for our most important methods. That way they will show up in the inspector and can be called directly from here so you won't have to set up any other scripts or UI stuff to send test values to them. Since we can only put headers on values, we need to switch to using the title attribute for their methods, and we will only show them in case we are in test mode. Would you like to see more applications for Odin in my videos? Let me know! This is fun! Again, if you enjoyed it, a like and subscribe would be very appreciated. Have a great week!